Okay, I would like to start part two of our first session uh, this afternoon by seeing if anyone has any other thoughts that they would like to share on the conventions. Any of our panelists from outside the campaigns? Yeah, I, I would just make um, one of the points about weather I think was actually bigger than people realize. And, and I don't actually think that the football stadium issue was as bad as the hurricane was for you guys because <laughs> Again with the hurricane. <laughs> with that? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think for those of us who went to both conventions, which I think is all, are all four of the journalists on the panel, the Tampa convention felt like there was a huge pall over it, not just because of the hurricane, but also the, I mean, this may seem like not that, something that's not that important to everyone else, but for, for everyone who was there, the security in Tampa was a mess, and the perimeter, people walking around, Lots of RNC staffers were referring to it as East Berlin, and um, you know, it, Charlotte just didn't feel as rough to be in, and I think that probably affected a lot of the overall media coverage. And coming off of it at the end, the Democrats had a very successful convention, and people were not expecting the Democrats to. The expectations were much lower because of some of the money going into, and Republicans were expected to have a, a better convention, and I think that did change the dynamic going into. Uh, the, the final phase of the campaign. Yeah. So I just think, oh. One thing on that, and this hasn't been said yet, and I think it's important for everyone to remember, and it goes back to a lot of questions we've had, is it is always easier to do this the second time. Um, you know what I mean? We learned lessons in uh, 2008 uh, in Denver that we were able to apply this time. Right. And, and we, it, it, even to the point of, you know, our motorcade guys were the same motorcade guys as last time from advance who had worked with the same secrets. You know, it's just the relationships are there, the prior knowledge is there. So I think we did have a, a built-in advantage on some of the organizational pieces there. So. Jeff, did you have something? I was going to say the same thing. I mean, I think that the Obama campaign had a huge advantage. A, they were doing it the second time, but B, it was the second convention. Right. So um, overall, though, I think it, it really uh, raised questions going forward about are these conventions really necessary in this, you know, <laughs> Maybe the conventions four years from now will be the exact same. I kind of doubt it. I think they'll be smaller, and um, you know, a there are a lot, uh, a lot of money. They're really expensive, and they're sort of like filled with the uh, landmines for the parties. So um, I would think that um, you know, a new form of convention could be sort of happening. I mean, campaigns are so different now with early voting, which we'll talk about. I'm sure. I think the conventions are a throwback. Well, one, one thing I think that you don't see when you're just an observer of these, and, and certainly the, the folks on the Obama campaign would be aware of this, when you lose a whole night, you don't just cut off that night and then just move forward. You know, there's, there was sort of a, traje a trajectory to the messaging that was lost because we lost that night. We had Ann Romney scheduled to speak on Monday night. You don't just, you know, cut that. And so it was, you know, to, to the point that, that um, our friends on the other side made, it was, you know, literally like throwing up the whole deck of cards and then having to re, you know, organize everything. Um, so it was, from an organizational standpoint, a huge uh, disadvantage having to lose that first night. Um, and, and it became sort of, um, you know, a little bit comical, um, the lengths to which some of the folks just wanted to kind of move forward and, um, you, know, you know, we're not sure if the weather's going to be this bad, maybe we can just, you know, you know, move forward and, you know, and, and obviously from a political standpoint, you know, we all felt that, um, that being, you know, uh, av avoiding risk was the most important thing and not being perceived as being insensitive to what was going on out there. But, um, but it, was, it was a huge challenge to, to completely re reorder those days. And as it turns out, it wasn't the first time we had to deal with a hurricane on the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, is a perfect lead into my next question. Mid-September, Mother Jones breaks the 47% comments that were made, I believe, at a fundraiser earlier in the year. Uh, in retrospect, looking back now, what kind of impact did that have and what were some of the other thoughts around the table? But I'm going to start with Katie and Ridge. Thank you. Well, I, uh, you I'll, get the I'll, easy I'll, ones. I'll start, I'll, I'll start uh, digging a hole and you can back up. <laughs> You know, it, this, this gets back to one of those million of little things that you, no matter how much you plan, no matter how, what the infrastructure is, no matter what you do, you know, the, the, you know being in the communication side, you, you dread those calls that comes in. By the way, you know, we, we basically found out when, when the world found out. Uh, you know, they, they, I, don't, I don't think the, the Obama campaign had any heads up it was coming, and we didn't. And, uh, 
So you look, look, you deal with it. It's it's just like uh, uh, any any number of things that are going to come up on a, on a campaign. I think they did a very good job of, uh, uh, of of weaving that into the narrative of what was already sort of in the back of people's minds and, and continuing to, uh, to to draw that that, that parallel with uh, you know it, there's there's nothing uh, stronger than a candidate's own words. I mean we 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 did it with uh, with President Obama. You know you didn't build this or any number of things and you know I brought this up last week you know they 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 went through this in, in their primary four years ago with uh, you know bitter people who cling to their guns and religion and that was filmed at a fundraiser or taped at a fundraiser and so you know you just deal with it and, and move on uh, again hindsight's 2020 you go back and, and look at it I'm sure there was an impact uh, you know whether it was those blue collar dims that we were looking to try to peel off and you know certainly in southeastern Ohio and uh, uh, you know, southern Wisconsin and and, uh, and other places. So I'm I'm sure it had an impact. I'm not sure how how easy it is to quantify that. Maybe our uh, our exit pollster can tell us. But uh, it, it was definitely a uh, um, you know it was definitely something that, that took us off uh, took us off our message and off our course for a while. Really. I think that um, you know coming out of the convention, you know that had been really our first opportunity to sort of tell the Mitt Romney story and, and, and without a doubt that um, you know, stopped us dead in our tracks in terms of trying to put forward any kind of um, proactive message. Um, you know, there's, prob there, there's probably no bigger Mitt Romney apologist than, than me. I, I, one of my big frustrations um, throughout the campaign is that I've always felt that, uh, that Mitt Romney was not in, in any way the guy that he was portrayed to be by our opponents or even in some cases by the media. Um, and, and I can't say that um, when, I, when I saw that clip, I, I, I don't even think it, it struck me as pat particularly harmful because I think I had actually heard him sort of articulate this before. And, and one of the things that I felt was so unfair about it is that it was, it was part of a conversation he was having about sort of a path to victory um, electorally. Um, that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, Governor Romney had a tendency to want to play uh, a strategist and, and sort of political operative. He, he sort of enjoys that and, you know, in those private moments would sometimes talk in those terms and, and sort of talk the way you would expect to hear, you know, a Rich Beeson talk or, a, a, you know, a political operative speak. Um, and, uh, and that's really what he was referring to. There, there's no doubt in my mind that Mitt Romney I know um, does not just dismiss 47% 40 of the American public in terms of people that he cares about. He was speaking in terms of, you know, sort of the path to victory electorally, and, and the reality is that, you know, there, there is a sort of a core group on both sides that are unattainable to the other side. And um, it was always sort of unfair to me the way that it was portrayed in the press uh, without any context at all. I mean, the media literally ran that story, ran that clip without ever presenting what the question was that was asked, that that was in response to, and without giving any um, context, because that's all they had, was just that little clip. And I always did feel that it was very irresponsible reporting on, on, on the part of the press to just run with that and not give it any kind of context. And certainly, you know, our opponents fanned the flames, and, and I can't say we wouldn't have done the same thing had the tables been turned. I don't fault them for that. Um, but it, <laughs> it was, it just in, is so far from the guy that Mitt Romney is that it was, a, it was a very frustrating period, I think, for all of us that are close to, to, to Mitt. Um, and, you know, one thing that I admire about him is that he just owned that. He, he, he did not, you know, when there were, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking heads, calling for the heads of campaign staff, you know, Mitt was the first one to get out there and say, look, it wasn't my team that said 47%, I said it. And, and he took full responsibility for it. And even though he knew it, it had been taken out of context, um, but certainly it had the effect of stopping us dead in our tracks. And um, uh, had we not had that Denver debate, um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, we could have come back from it in such a dramatic way. What did you guys think when you heard? Um, <laughs> Stay seated, Merry please, Brent. Christmas. <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, a couple things. Uh, uh, one is, is obviously, um, you know, what's funny is that what I think people don't see is you something like that happens, and there's a deliberative process that takes place on the other side. It's not a, a knee-jerk reaction. You have to look at it, figure out, 
you know, whatever the thing is that happened bad to the other person. There's an analysis process about how does this fit into everything else that's going on? Do we have vulnerabilities close to this? How are we going to exploit this? In a way, uh, that was, especially after the full tape what was released, um, it was a moment of us having to have some self-imposed discipline to focus in on the 47% part. Because there were other things in that speech that were potentially harmful, given things he had said publicly about foreign policy, uh, the military, Iraq. So we did have to do a, a fair amount of self-discipline. Um, and obviously do not know the governor and don't know what is in his mind, but you know, it, it's a good illustration of how much words are important, and especially words, like you said, that come out of the candidate's mouth. Um, he may have been talking about electoral, uh, uh, electoral path and a group of voters, but some of the words that were around it made it really easy for us. Mm -hmm. So when he talked about, I mean, I don't remember what the exact verbiology was now, but you know, folks that don't contribute or whatever it was, it made it very easy for us to frame it in a certain way. Um, but uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was one of those things that just showed up time and again, and, and we didn't have to fan it too much. I mean, it just showed up. It stuck with people, and it goes back to that idea that it reinforced an idea people already had, right or wrongs, right? So um, you know, people who uh, had already sort of thought that because of Bain now really thought this about him in terms of his relationship with a certain group of voters. So we saw it come up. I mean, it was un it was one of those odd things, you s or one of those. Are not odd, but rare things you see in campaigns because we always are trying to make something out of, you know, we're always trying to make things bigger. Um, that just came up in focus group after focus group. You know, we would be talking about coal and it would come up. You know, just one of those things. And those things happen in campaigns. Well, we know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just kept thinking of how terribly destabilizing it was to your organization. I mean, not just within your headquarters organization. I saw it in a couple of the states, uh, just people who had come out of the convention, you know, concerned about the Eastwood situation, et cetera, but we're still back in the phone banks and doing what they're supposed to do, and then that hit, hit. and it's just, there's nothing worse in mid-September than to turn off your people, your own people, especially in an early voting uh, environment where we are now. It was a critical timing issue. My other thought was, I wondered what was going to come next. <laughs> I thought, okay, if this one's come out, were there more of these? Right. And I thought, I think we were lucky, we were lucky that there weren't any more. I think there's a couple of things here. I think one, Brent's team did a great job, and, and he talked about self-discipline. If we had really jumped on it, gone out with an ad right away, like been all over it, it would have, we wanted it to have its own oxygen. Yeah. I mean, with a thing like that, people, don't, people are much less likely to believe a campaign ad or a campaign spin than they are just something that's out there. And it was very organic, and people were just, it, it broke through like a lot of things don't break through. So I think they did, the Brent team did a good job of not trying to engage right away and let it, let it hang out there. The other thing I think is that the president, and part of it, you go back to 2008, um, you know, the San Francisco, I was in Pennsylvania primary at the time, didn't play so well there. Um, <laughs> so I, I, know what you, I know what it feels like. Um, but you think about it, the president didn't have a moment like that in this campaign. I mean, that is a, that, no one talks about that because you don't talk about things that don't happen. But that's pretty remarkable um, that he didn't have really, I mean, we have, we'll have a moment that I'm sure you're going to get to in a minute. But he didn't have any of those moments that fundraisers are things that were said behind the cameras that were damaging to us, that was a big deal. I also think that it took you guys a really long time to respond, and I can't imagine what was going on in your headquarters. You know, do you go out, do you tackle it, do you just address it right away? Is the whole tape gonna come out? Like, I, you know, but it took, it, it, and probably would have had it anyway. I mean, it had one, two, three, four, five days where it was the dominant story. Uh, and I don't know if- Was it just five days? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it sort of lingered, right? <laughs> I don't know if you could have done anything differently, but it did seem like it took a long time. Uh, and we talked about this at the, in, the, in Boston. And, and you know, it's something to analyze later, you know, what, what were both campaigns and others doing the, the days after and how was it covered and what did that have to do. But what I will say is we saw our poll numbers go up. Yep. But our, the, we, what we saw was in the internal polling is that our gap increased, but our number didn't go up. So take a state where we were winning 47, 41. It didn't go from f to 51. 38, it went from 47 to 38. So what we were seeing is not people coming to the president who weren't otherwise. We saw soft supporters of Mitt Romney become undecided voters. Mm -hmm. And those folks came right back. And they were gonna slowly come back. We gave them an opportunity to come back quickly with the first debate, but they came back. Um, and so I, I don't know how damaging it was overall. I mean, it was part of the overall narrative that it played into. But we, we had sort of an inflated, inflated numbers afterwards that were not sustainable. Right. Two, two quick things on that. I think one, and this is kind of a, a more 30,000 foot point, but one that always bears repeating in, in any discussion like this is that 
at the end of the day, we build these giant machines, we hire as many talented people as we can, but it comes down to the guy, right? It's the candidate. Uh, and it's what they say and do that at the end of the day and what their thought process is that drives this. And that's one of those moments that I wish, Mitt, I'm sure Mitt Romney wishes he could have back, but he was the guy with his name on the poster and it got out and you know, we've all dealt with those in various campaigns. And, and to that point, to Bill, to put a bow on this if we can. <laughs> to, <laughs> we, we, uh, uh, we, what we did is uh, we had a meeting at the campaign and, and uh, you know, there was the, the rapid response part of it. That, you know, he went out that night, I think we had a fundraiser in Arizona, he went out that night and first addressed it. But then we, uh, as a campaign, got together first, and then, and then with Governor Romney, and came up with, with a five-point plan. And, and, uh, and the three big ones were, first, uh, number one, was have a strong first debate. And that, that, was, you know, that, that was before the first debate, but that was, that was number one. And the governor obviously owned the 47%. He said, I said it. And he knew that the, that, that first debate was very important. We saw him perform in Florida in the primary in the first debate. We also, uh, it, it was important to, to have him uh, look more presidential. We had him, you know, at these rallies, he would have his shirt sleeves rolled up, he'd have the microphone, and he'd be going back and forth on the stage, uh, you know, revving up these, these, these party faithful. And you would see President Obama behind a podium with the microphone, looking very presidential, getting, getting their, their points across in the nightly news. So we wanted to make sure and, 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 and have Governor Romney start appearing like that. So you started seeing him behind a podium with, with notes and, and, and preparing that way. And then the other was, was starting to uh, um, uh, shake up our events a little bit, of making them, uh, you know, we, we, we put them on all over the country and, and we wanted to have some continuity to those to start, uh, to start giving him some, some continuity so that he wasn't bouncing around on different things and, and, and having a, 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 a consistent message every night. So. Yeah. That, that was the plan, uh, but he had to deliver on the first point, and uh, he obviously did. Yeah, and then, um, no, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, why, those why, of you, yeah, James. Why did it take so long for him to apologize? He didn't give that Fox interview for like two plus weeks to say uh, it was wrong. Like, it seems like one of those things where it, it, it was more than a five-day story, and it, it could have been a five-day story, but it became one. I, I think it just gets back to Katie's point of what the point that he was making in there was electorally, and so, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I wasn't privy to that. Well, I also think that it's, um, your inclination is to sort of hope that something like that isn't gonna last quite right. so long. And um, you, you sort of hope that at some point the oxygen will, will you know, pull out and the, and the, the, the fire will die. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, he came out that first night, he came out again three days later. It wasn't like he just, you know, stuck his head in the sand and acted like he had never said it. Um, but you know, there, there's a lot that you don't know. You don't, you know, we, we hadn't videotaped that event. So we didn't have, uh, you know, a, a transcript of everything that had been said. So it's hard to sort of get out there and, you know, and, and for those that followed uh, Governor Romney, with few exceptions, he spoke, you know, with no prepared notes. So he didn't have speeches to, you know, to go back and look at. This was, I think, part of a Q&A session. Um, so, you know, there was a limit to how far I think he was going to go without really recalling, you know, the whole context of everything that was said. Um, but, you know, as, as things continued to, to sort of, you know, flame up, you know, you know, we made strategic decisions about what had to be done, but you never could have anticipated that the day that it, it all came out. I'm curious to know, I don't know if we covered this in Harvard, did you guys know about that beforehand? I, I did not know. I mean, you never know. They're big operations. But my understanding is that we didn't know. I think no, that got yeah. asked, and I think everybody yeah. was yeah. yeah, asked, and none of the folks that were there. If I, we, can, I, I can tell you, we weren't prepared for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, 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 Aaron has a question. Yeah, I was Aaron. just going to ask, you know, obviously you don't always want candidates to micromanage and be too involved in the strategy, but obviously this is something that he had to be involved in. So first, who had the uh, job of getting to tell him what had, had, had happened? And, you know, do, do you know what his reaction was in, in going through what you were going to do to address it. You know, you said you came up with a five-point plan with him, but how did he handle it? Well, he, we were on a call um, the night that it came out. It was a Monday night, um, I remember pretty vividly. And he was actually on his way to a fundraiser in California. And um, we got on a call with him. And typically, we did you know, a, a, you know, a call with him prior to any sort of public events um, early in the day. So to have a call like this happen at what I think was about eight or nine o'clock Eastern time, um, you know, he gets on the call and is kind of like, well, this can't be good. <laughs> you know, what's, you know, why are we having a call like this at this hour of the day? 
Um, and um, you know, there was a there was a whole group of us on the phone, and um, you know, what we knew at that point in time was just that little clip, what was relayed to him, and um, you know, we talked about you know that you know from. There was a little bit of a discussion about um, the fact that some folks felt that there was a need for him to come out immediately and say something. Um, I think, uh, and I think he agreed on that pretty immediately. The question was, you know, what do we say? Because there's a lot that we don't know. You know, so how how you know forward leaning can you be when you don't really know the whole context of everything? You know, we didn't know the question that was asked. We didn't know what came before or after that little um, snippet. Um, and so, you know, we were just, you know, to some degree, we're flying blind. But it was almost never uh, Governor Romney's instinct to not kind of be out there and address it. Um, you know, his, his, he instinctively, you know, if he felt that he had, you know, made a misstep, he felt like he should be the one out there to clean it up. Let's, uh, let's follow up on a, on a point that Rich made just a couple minutes ago, your five-point plan for kind of turning the campaign around. And for those of you who haven't been in big campaigns, you, you think these things are far more complicated, but a five-point plan is actually something you can execute and you can actually hope to achieve. And so it's simplicity, so it's really a nice approach. The first was doing well at the debate. I have two questions for everybody on the four debates. One is, why did the first debate go so well for the governor and so poorly for the president? And two, uh, did the other three debates really matter in the overall scheme of things? Well, I, I, I don't know who. You go gonna... for it. Um, everybody, everybody is open, open discussion on this. This was something we talked a little bit about last week. I, I think certainly the first time that, that a nominee stands on the stage with the president of the United States, it's sort of, you know, by default is going to be a good moment for, uh, you know, for the person that's not the incumbent. Um, and so I think that, that we did have that advantage going in. One thing I saw repeated, well, two things I saw repeatedly from Mitt Romney in the course of this campaign is that he is the most prepared person that I've ever uh, uh, seen in politics. I mean, he, he takes that so seriously. And you know, starting as early as early summer, um, you know, he was very uh, emphatic about taking time out of the schedule to, to prepare for the debates. He really believed that they were going to be pivotal, and that the election was not going to be won or lost because we did you know two or three fewer rallies per week uh, when he could be taking time to prep for the debates. Um, He's, he's a super hardworking guy. He was never, never ever took time off for himself, but was very emphatic about taking time to prepare. But the other thing that I always saw in him is that when it was crunch time, he brought it. In the primaries, time and time again, when his back was up against the wall and we as, a, as an organization needed him to just bring it at a time when only he could do it, he did that and, and you know, almost never uh, uh, failed to, to step up. Um, I don't think we could have imagined that Denver could have gone quite as well as it did. Um, I think, you know, I'll let, let the, the Obama folks um, speak to, you know, what was going through their organization's um, strategy. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, our guy just had a really, really good night. I think he, frankly, I think he had three pretty good nights, but I think he had one exceptionally good night. Um, and. Uh, it was because of those two things that he prepares and because he brings his A-game when he needs to. Governor Romney early on told Beth Myers he wanted to be this treated, a, he called it the Manhattan Project. It was very important to him. He's the very, debate preparation. The debate preparation. I think he had 16 uh, debate uh, prep sessions before uh, the first debate, uh, including a, a very extensive uh, debate camp uh, up in, uh, in Vermont. Uh, the other thing is, is and you, you go back historically and look at this, it's very hard to tell a sitting president, you know, who gets daily presidential briefings, uh, you know, probably the most informed person in the world, you know, debate prep has got to be a little difficult. You, you go back, George W. Bush's first debate, any, any number of them, uh, and, and it's probably the first time President Obama has had somebody disagree with him quite that vociferously in, in several years. And so that, that first debate, I think, is, uh, is a wake-up call, I guess, is, is, is a good way to put it. It was also an expectations game. You kept looking at the polls in the weeks before. There was a few poll that came out the day before the debate. 
huge number, a huge percentage of people expected Obama to win, including Republicans. And so I think the bar was very low for Governor Romney. He obviously did do a good job, but it, it, it seemed inevitable. It also seemed that people were kind of looking for the race to tighten and, and exactly candidates who are coming in traditionally perform better. So there was this a sense that Romney was going to win the debate before the debate even happened. Yeah, I, I want uh, uh, Brent and Jeremy and Marlon to comment on this, but uh, from your point of view, as you sat there and you watched the debate, did you guys sense there was a problem or anything? Or, <laughs> or did you find, or did, did everybody figure it out afterwards? Because I know it took your spin teams about 10 minutes to get out on the floor afterwards. Yeah, I think that's, that's not about that's not about figuring out right. if, there, if there is a problem. That should, that should be that should be the new measure for who wins a debate is right. whose team is in the room first. Right. Right. It's like you know, it's it's weird. But uh, I know Jeremy, you want to? <laughs> I, I, I think I mean, I think everybody and and, and Axe would be the first one to say that um, you know that wasn't a good performance and the campaign, the people that prepped him are some of the best folks. Um, you know, and, and he, he, we had a bad night, um, and it was, it wasn't sort of a little bit bad, it was bad, and, uh, we knew it, the campaign knew it, we knew we had to respond. Um, I think the hardest thing for the president, honestly, is that when he went into that debate, and right out of the gate, um, a lot, it was, it was in some ways Mitt Romney's edge sketch moment. For us, all of a sudden class sizes mattered, they didn't matter at all in the primary. All of a sudden his tax plan wasn't the plan that was on his website, and I think, I think debating that is difficult. Um, and I think it threw the president off, and I don't know that he, he just never got back on. You know, you watch a lot of debates, you're like, well, we had a bad first half, you always think you're going to come back. Right. The camp, it can't, this can't continue, we're going to come back at some point. And it just, it just really threw him off early on. And, you know, I think he was, uh, you know, it was for him, though, afterwards, uh, because I think he, you know, look, anybody who runs for president, uh, and anybody who's become president, uh, fights, you know, when their back is against the wall is going to come through. I think for him, it really, coming out of it, really energized him and he I think very much like they, they mentioned Governor Romney you know he didn't blame this on anybody he didn't say oh we didn't prep me you didn't do this or he said you know I'm gonna come back and, the, and I'm gonna do uh, better in the next debates and every other thing you know it sort of I think it energized him he's a competitor I think he, he knew that he didn't do as well as he wanted to do uh, wanted, wanted to and then and it really energized him coming out of it kind of in a, in a, in a way that we didn't expect but I think one positive too um, First of all, yes, we, as the debate, debate was going on, um, yes. Um, but I think a positive is it killed any sense of complacency that could have happened amongst our, our staff and volunteers out there in the field. Because there was, I think you just mentioned a second ago, people expected us to win. Uh, the polls on that point were in our favor. And when you have a, you know, you're trying to run a large organization, particularly between the September and November election, uh, you have to have some moments to, you know, make sure folks know that, like, this is, yeah, this is serious. Keep going, keep going, and that's, you keep adding fuel to the fire uh, for what you're out there doing. And I remember I went to knock on, I went to visit the Virginia team a week later, uh, before the second debate. I was knocking on doors, and people were still supportive, and they were like, "Hell, Bobby's got to do better the second debate." Uh, and I was like, "Thank you for telling me, as if I'm Obama." Um, and um, but I do think it was good because they were they were they were more like, "Okay, you know, now I got to go out there and now I got to you know get going, and it's not over." Um, and so I do think there was there was. I'm not saying that would, you know, we all hope that that would happen, but I think there was a positive reaction in that people understood, okay, this election is not done uh, in October. This we got to keep going through November. It, it was a, it was a very interesting bad debate. Uh, you know, I'm sure your staff too had to sit there. Is you know, the thing that happens the two days before a debate is CNN, Fox, and MSNBC show ad nauseum every bad debate moment from the history of televised debates. Right. <laughs> so they have one story they do. They show you know the Dan Quayle, you're no Jack Kennedy, but they do all this. And it was a, a bad debate, but there wasn't a bad moment. There wasn't a, there wasn't a TV ad in there, right? So that was good, if you're gonna take a good out of a bad. I, I know, right? Um, uh, so that was interesting. And, and too, and, and getting back to Jeremy's point, the president said this himself afterwards, you know, people forget that running for office is a skill set, and that it's not the same skill set as being president or, or any other skill set, and that, you know, there was a little bit of rust there, you know, and he had to get back into that. And I think that you kind of, the whole world watched that process play out uh, on stage that night. And then uh, the third point, this goes back to something um, that uh, the bird was saying earlier, was when we, saw, when we saw your support drop and ours not move after things like the 47%, you know, the Romney surge from where we sat, we didn't see ourselves lose a lot of voters after that debate either. Now, people may have had softer support, I'm not saying we didn't lose anybody, but our, our, seat, our floor was still pretty much there, and the surge was really those soft supporters coming home, right? 
Uh, and some of it was we had kind of created this vision of the governor and he walked out there and wasn't that vision. And I think a lot of people were like, gave him that second look and, and I, like I said, just kind of came home. Yeah. So Jeff, did you have something else that you wanted to jump in on there? I think in terms of that vision of the governor, I mean, I think it was very clear that uh, President Obama had come to believe that vision of the governor. Um, I've covered uh, President Obama for uh, a long time when he was U.S. Senator, when he was a state senator in Illinois, and one th a constant sort of uh, character uh, trait that he has, he's a very confident guy, but I think he also, um, over the years, he uh, doesn't necessarily think that some people are as good as he is, and I think that he um, believed that Mitt Romney was the person he saw in the Republican primary campaign, and I think he sort of believed all the ads and just, and obviously like he had a day job, you know, so he was playing the role as president and he didn't really have time for all this, but uh, I remember hearing from a few people in the weeks before the debate, in the week before the debate, um, and, and he was out in uh, Nevada, in Henderson, Nevada at a resort doing um, some uh, practice sessions and John Kerry was uh, helping him out and some people were saying, gosh, like we don't think he's ready for this. I'm like, oh, they're just lowering expectations. You know, of course he's ready. Like he knows the whole thing about how the sitting president blows the first debate, you know. But there were some actual warning signs from people who were in the room who did not think that his head was in the game. Um, so in the end it turned out fine, but it was a very, very, very a risky thing I think that he did to the campaign. Um, so it was uh, fascinating to watch. One point that I think is a little bit lost is that these are two guys that don't know each other. You know, when you have, you know, uh, John McCain and Barack Obama running against each other, they've at least served in the Senate right. together. They've come, you know, they've crossed paths. Um, Governor Romney, um, I, I think, had met the president one time, and it was very much in passing. They had never even had a conversation before. So literally, this was the first time that they encountered each other in any way. And the other thing that I think um, to some degree was an advantage that we had is we saw in the primaries how important debates were, how many people watched these things and how they could just swing, you know, uh, the, the um, sort of momentum so dramatically. And so, and so I think that was um, part of the reason that Governor Romney felt so strongly about the prep time for this, that he really felt like it was going to be more important than almost anything else he did. Um, so those were just sort of two interesting okay, things. Nancy and Jerry, I think, want to make some comments. I just wanted to mention, uh, we shouldn't overlook the role that Twitter played in that debate. And we should, I mean, I was watching that debate here with a lot of you. And uh, at the same time, tweeting it out and receiving everybody's tweets and receiving all the press's tweets and the campaign's tweets and your tweets, actually, um, are people for you. And it was really a dynamic that we've never seen in any other election in any other first debate that anyone's had to deal with. And so I've often thought, would it be, inter it would be interesting to go back and see that debate, uh, trying to put the, the hat on or the head on of somebody who's not in this per particular era and see if it was as bad. I mean, it just, it was piled on as being extra bad. And well, it was I mean, ironic, given it, your digital presence, yeah, that it came it, back it, and slapped you. It changed, yeah. you know, the, the dynamics changed. It used to be that the conventional wisdom was set within the first 15 minutes after the debate ended. We went back and looked, I mean, conventional wisdom was set in the first 15 minutes of the debate. Yeah. That was it. Now, yeah. like, you know, the counter narrative is, as Bird said, we never came back. <laughs> so, I mean, you would have had to see a different conversation go. But, but we adjusted our digital strategy around that and, and yeah. paid more attention to those first few minutes and wanted to make sure we were getting our message out uh, on all platforms then. So it was and definitely a subsequent debate. Too. Subsequent. Yeah. 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 That's, and that's okay. why I wonder if the impact wasn't quite the same in the subsequent debates, because you did do that. Yeah. Jerry, did you? Just, just one observation. You know, um, I did an interesting thing before the debate, because I hadn't seen Barack Obama debate for four years, so I went back and watched some of the McCain-Obama mm -hmm. debates. And the no drama Obama style actually worked very well against John McCain. And I actually wrote, much to my regret, something that said that should work pretty well here because he's the front runner, just can't screw it up. And it worked well against John McCain. It didn't work against Mitt Romney because Mitt Romney happens to be better at this than John McCain who was kind of just sputtering around. So I sort of thought, I see what the, what the president's trying to do here. He's trying to, to have the no drama Obama style that worked so well four years ago, but it didn't work well here. That was the first point I was gonna make. The second point I was gonna make and to build on what you were saying, I thought that the impression of that debate was cemented immediately afterwards, but not by conservatives, but by MSNBC. I mean, 
I, I just happened to swear. Yes. It was savage. It was yes. brutal. I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it's thought, you know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, Philadelphia Phillies fans going after the home team, which they do very well. It's like, that was just brutal. And I thought that's what cemented the impression that it was not just bad, but really bad and probably worse than it actually yeah. was. And I'm a Philadelphia Phillies fan, so I can, I can uh, Sorry. echo that. But Nancy's point, I, I didn't watch any of the three debates on TV. I watched them all on Twitter. I sat in my bed with my mm -hmm. iPhone and watched, and you could tell 15 minutes in, not that, you know, usually it's the Republicans going, yeah, and the Democrats going, yeah, the Republicans kept going, yeah, and the Democrats just disappeared or said, what the hell's going They're on? Turned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and, and you saw that immediately yeah. on Twitter, and you would not have, yeah. if you were just watching TV, you would not have gotten I think that. the adjusting the strategy point you made uh, is, is really key as well, too. Not only did, I mean, obviously the president hadn't debated in a while, but you, as a staff, we hadn't, you know, organized around a debate ourselves in a while, right? And so, to, you know, he said he's going to do better next time. I think all of us got together, like, how can we even prepare better? And so, this, by the second debate, what these guys were doing on the Twitter, on the digital media side, I think was was extremely impressive, and you noticed that we got a little bit better. And I think by the third debate, it was like a well oil machine well, where we just knew what was going you could on. See ten right. minutes in, right. the Democrats like, yes. Yes. Oh, God. Okay, I, I want to move along, but I want to ask a gentleman from the Obama campaign. Yeah. I I was involved in the Reagan campaign in '84, and, and you guys were very young then, so I don't know if you've gone back and studied it. But in the second debate, the president looked very old. The age issue came up. We saw our tracking go from an 18-point national lead in about three days to a nine-point lead. You never saw anything even remotely approaching anything like that in the few days afterwards. First of all, I'd love to be in a position to see an 18-point lead go to a nine-point lead. <laughs> right. Of course, and I was going to say the president won re-election with right. 49 states, That's but right. anyway. Um, no, we, I mean, we saw, again, we saw people go back to Romney. We lost, I mean, I, I can't say we didn't lose voters, but we did not see a dramatic shift in our core vote. I mean, our modeling didn't change. No, I mean, what, here's what happened. So 24 hours after, we were, we, were, we were, you know, again, but it was like this, not this. We weren't losing votes, but he was, he was coming up. 48 hours, it was a little bit more. But it was, the key was about three days out, it stopped. Like, there wasn't just right. a continual rise. And so there was still a gap. It, wasn't a, it was obviously much smaller. Um, and it was pretty consistent across states. So, um, and that was mostly voters you assumed would have found their way home. To yeah, well, they, I mean, I think we accelerated their... Yeah, their right. trip home. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, but I think they were going to go there slowly, right. you know, at least we had modeled them to, to end up, you know, voting for, for Mitt Romney. So, but it, it definitely accelerated that. The great thing, I think, on our side, and I saw this after the New Hampshire primary in the, uh, in, the, in the 2008 campaign, the next day, Marlon and I are sitting there saying, all right, we've got young staffers out in the middle of nowhere, and they're going to freak out. You know, they're going to see a poll that shows it getting closer, and we have to figure out a way to be leaders. So we're trying to figure out, you know, we do, we don't want to overblow, we don't want to get on a call with everybody and say, like, don't freak out, because then they're going to freak out. Um, <laughs> so, you know, how do you play that? And the great thing is that it, it really did not, it made our, it definitely our, our staff, our organizers, you know, look, you don't go do this for 20 hours a day if you're not committed. It hardened them, and they were, you know, we had, they had our, John Gilbert, our field director in Florida, had already sent out a message to everybody that said, well, oh, you know, right. while they're celebrating this, um, we're going to go register voters tomorrow. And they all sort of responded in a way that I really was, uh, it really showed me yep. kind of what they were made of and that they weren't here for an e They didn't think this was going to be easy from the beginning. So, you know, that was one big thing for us. And, and just, that goes back to my point about trying to turn it into a positive was, you know, we were, we were prepared to talk to our staff, but they were already doing it. Like, I've been telling you guys who've been looking at these rosy polls that it was going to be a race, right, and that this was going to shrink because of that. And to the question you asked earlier, one of your questions was, did the other debates matter? Yes, right? If we went to the second debate and it had been a repeat performance, then I think that we would have you know, been in trouble, but we were able to obviously stabilize and the third debate was, uh, was even better. But I, I, at the end of the day, I think it was a good, I, it wasn't good, but I think it was a good jump start, right, in terms of like, this is not over, okay. we gotta well, keep I going. Okay, I... Also exaggerated, I think it exaggerated mm -hmm. the response to the convention and exaggerated the bounce back mm -hmm. from the debates because the likely voter models, the public polls we're using, I think we're dependent too much on enthusiasm. And as each side got more enthusiastic or less enthusiastic, you'd see big changes in the likely voter models. But if you looked at the registered voter models, and right. the, they were much more stable throughout. Yeah, I, I, I've got two more topics I want to cover, but I want to get to Q&A as well. So the first one, though, needs a little bit of time and attention. Uh, we heard all during the campaign about the fabulous ground game, the fabulous voter ID turnout, 
micro-targeting that you guys ran. We had Sasha Eisenberg here, for those of you who are here in the audience when Sasha was here. Uh, he wrote a whole book on some of the things that the President's campaign and the Romney campaign were doing. And he flat out told me that night, you guys were going to win, no hands down, because of what you were doing. Uh, Jeremy and Marlon especially, but Brent jumped in where you'd like to too, but can you guys speak a little bit to the ground game, kind of share with our guests uh, what you guys pulled together, uh, and then I want to get uh, uh, Rich and Katie to talk a little bit about the Romney voter ID tur turnout program, uh, and then get reactions from around the table, because I, I will give you guys total credit. I never thought in a year when intensity was on the other side, or at least the perception was intensity on the other side, turn out that you could do that and make it work. How did you make it work? Um, so I think you know, one thing is there's no silver bullet. And you know, uh, a lot of people after the campaign are trying to write, well, it was because you had this digital tool or this technology, and so that somehow made a difference. It was kind of everything. But look, our, our philosophy was this. We needed to make this a state-by-state -state race. And we needed to take a state like Florida and turn it into a battle over each precinct. Um, and we needed to fight in each town in New Hampshire and each ward in Philadelphia um, and really make it because uh, we believe that, you know, in order to win Florida, we had to register X number of people, persuade X number of people, and then turn out, get the turnout higher uh, with certain, you know, demographics. And we, we wanted to do that. Um, we needed to do that person to person, neighbor to neighbor. We believed fundamentally that the core of our strategy was you can't outsource this stuff to a paid vendor to call voters and try to persuade them. You need their neighbors talking to them about the president's record. You need to have that conversation multiple times to move them your way. In order to register somebody, you can't just, you, you can do all the digital stuff you want. You can do all the earned media to back that up. You've got to have a full program. At the end of the day, you need to put a clipboard in front of somebody in a non-online registration state and have them fill out that registration form. And then you need to follow up with them and get them to actually turn out. So we just believed that we could actually make it a sort of precinct by precinct. Our whole field program is based on this concept of neighborhood teams, that not one individual working their precinct, but a group of people working a series of precincts as a team would be more effective. And we sort of built this out of the 2007-2008 uh, campaign. Uh, and we gave those teams specific goals. And we told them, you know, you're going to own this. And then we provided an organizer to coach them, support them, make sure that we were hearing from them, make sure that we were giving them direction. Um, and, and, and so that, that's how we built it. Um, we believed in it from the beginning. We put a lot of resources in it. At the same time, we were putting resources early in TV and getting some criticism for it. We put a lot of resources early into the field program, um, and there was a lot of criticism for that. You know, what are you doing putting people on the ground in 2011? Well, we were building this up. We were testing things. We were, we were using some analytics, you know, to figure out how we could register pe more people per shift in 2011 so that when people really started to register to vote towards the end in 2012, we'd be prepared for that. So, you know, I think it was just the nitty gritty, non-sexy hard work of uh, running, a, running a field program, doing it on a massive scale, having a digital, um, you know, integration of that, a technology background of that, and, and sort of all aspects of the campaign, trying to figure out how they could be helpful to that effort, because that's ultimately what we were trying to do. I, I think, well, first I want to give I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say give credit to all of our field directors in the states because they, uh, Bert and I's job is more supporting what they, they needed on a daily basis and, and they are, are some of the best people I work with, some of the best people in politics and so the, each, to the point where we have a state by state organization, we had very special people, field directors in each state who ran a different program in each state. I just think it's, 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 we have to uh, give them the recognition they deserve. Um, a couple things, I think one, starting early, again, it was just huge. Um, and having people out there early, uh, and it, it was a gamble. We mentioned another gamble in terms of you know trying to find Romney early versus later. Starting early and spending all you know money on field that early, um, it's a gamble. And at the end of the day, like you know, for us, we wanted to show that organizing works. Uh, the reason we do this matters, uh, not just uh, it's it's how you can you know change the world, frankly. Um, and, and it was a gamble, and, and luckily it was, it was a successful gamble. The other thing um, that I think is extremely important um, is training. Uh, and we take, uh, took great pride in making sure our staff were trained, uh, making sure our volunteers were trained. We had a training team who were fantastic, who designed specific curriculum uh, for uh, all types of staff, the types of volunteers, our neighborhood teams, uh, the volunteers who worked for our neighborhood teams. Uh, and, you know, we, we gave them goals, et cetera, and, and, and held them to data-driven metrics that we knew we had to do to win, but we knew they could not accomplish that unless we trained them uh, to do so. We were very meticulous about our training. 
Um, two other points, and I'll shut up because I could talk about this all day. Um, I think you know we invest in people. I talked about the training. I have a core belief, and Bird does too, that people will come to our organization because they believe in the candidate, and we couldn't have run the type of program we did without the president. Uh, but they will stay uh, because of the staff. Uh, and we spent a lot of time investing in the staff, had a huge training with the staff in October the year before uh, with just our core staff who we knew would ultimately be the leaders, um, not just the field directors, but you know, deputy field directors, regionals, who would be the leaders of the campaign um, as we got into 2012 and trained them very, very well so that when you got more staff in, uh, they would be teaching uh, folks uh, right behaviors uh, to be able to execute this work. Uh, and, and really train them also on just management skills. Uh, things people forget a lot of this when you have a large organization. Uh, management is extremely important because that's how you're going to deliver a message up and down the chain. And so that, uh, we really took pride in that. Uh, and then just echoing Bird, people work together very well in teams. And that was just the model of our field program in terms of getting people together. When they get together, they have fun. And they're, they're doing it all for the president, but then they learn about each other. They share values with each other. Uh, and, and then they also are not just doing it for the president, but they're doing it for each other. And when volunteers are working together, uh, it makes a huge difference. So we just had those core beliefs, had those core values, put the plan in place, and uh, you know, luckily it worked out. I don't have a lot to add here, but one thing I do think is, is very important. Um, you know, as someone who spent most of their time, in terms of my relationship to the field program, telling people like Sasha, who is a very good friend, no, you're not allowed to talk to them. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's been a fascinating process to watch. And, and I think what people have to understand that they don't always understand is campaigns don't happen in vacuums. They're not necessarily standalone events. And that what we saw happen in 2012 was uh, the end of a, or the next step in an evolutionary process. And that, uh, you know, these guys are too humble to say it, but, you know, the two of them, Mitch, uh, Jen O'Malley, Dillon, uh, these are folks a lot of these ideas go back to the Dean campaign of 04 or things that the Edwards campaign tried out in Iowa or, you know, these are things that you learn from and you do better every time. Um, so it's not just born out of whole cloth in 2012. And as a party, we have been incredibly fortunate, and this is not always the case on either side of the aisle, that a lot of really talented, smart people have decided to dedicate a good part of their professional career to field which is not necessarily seen as the kind of sexy side of politics. And we've seen the fruits of that. And uh, you know, we're lucky to have it. Uh, hopefully the work these guys put in, in terms of cultivating that next generation of folks who will think, yeah, this is a really great thing I can do in a way I can contribute. We'll keep that moving forward. But I think we're, it's an unusual thing that that happened. I want to know from um, Katie and Rich, uh, you guys, everybody felt the Romney campaign was going to close the gap. Do you guys felt that you closed the gap, say, versus McCain? You did better than McCain. but. <laughs> We, we did. First, first I want to start off with complimenting, just following up on what they said. Jeremy and his team did something that uh, uh, it was truly amazing. They, they did alter the electorate. In, in politics, you want to get as close to a one-to-one -one campaign as you can get. You want to, if you can run a presidential campaign like a sheriff's race or a county commissioner's race, that's ideal. They've got as close to that as, as any presidential campaign in history, and, and, it, and it's really amazing what they were able, able to do. I think there's a tendency on the losing side to say, well, whatever you did didn't work. And as we go through and, and look at our after action and, and, and what, what worked and what didn't, we were, it, obviously we had the resources, but we had more data, uh, more, uh, more IDs, more volunteers, more contacts than any other Republican presidential campaign uh, has before, and that includes President Bush in 2004. But clearly it wasn't to the, to the extent and the level that the, the Obama campaign was. And we keep hearing about time. That's one thing, but they're also very incredibly organized and, and, and disciplined. But uh, yeah, I, I think, and I think this came out at, uh, at, at, in Boston last week, at 800 staff on the ground in Florida on election day. Is that, I mean, just that level of granularity, being able to be responsible for 35 people, where we were, we were never going to get to that, uh, that ability just because, again, starting um, April of 2011 versus uh, you know, May and June of 2012. But, but again, I think we did some things well. We were able to do ID, uh, ID a lot more extensively than we ever have uh, on any campaign. Uh, the, the, the ground operation, our doors, uh, early on I, I put an emphasis on doors. We put an emphasis on knocking on doors. Uh, we knocked on, in 2008, knocked on 2.5 million doors uh, on the 2008 campaign. We knocked on over 15 million in, in 2012. So uh, that, you know, again, I think there were good things, uh, just, just doesn't uh, stand up to what, uh, what the Obama campaign was able to do. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to all the folks who are from outside the campaigns, the, our, our, our uh, analysts and journalists here. 
I'm going to, and I'm going to start with Jerry in just a second, but I want each of you just to talk, you know, if you have any comments on the Obama ground, ground game, please offer them, or on the Romney uh, effort, but also just say at the very beginning, did you think it would be as effective as it turned out to be prior to election day? Jerry? Yes. Because you just made a really good point about, you know, you lose sometimes like everything is terrible, and that wasn't the case, right? And I think just from our standpoint, too, we weren't perfect, uh, and there's a lot that, and we're, we're still digging through it now that we are continuing to learn from so that way we can continue to build the party uh, moving forward. I just think it's an important point that we think we did a good job, um, but you know we, we still have a lot to do to make sure this, this continues. Jerry? Look, I, I did not think it would be as, as effective as it was. Um, you know, we want to poll the Wall Street Journal NBC News poll, which is a pretty good media poll. We probably, in retrospect, place too much emphasis on the enthusiasm question. I had interesting conversations with Joel Benenson about this over time. Um, and you guys proved that you can take people in a year in which uh, enthusiasm has actually dropped, and I don't think anybody would dispute that, and still get them to show up. And I think that was a point in question. And, you know, did I think the Obama campaign would win? I thought, but I didn't think you'd win by three percentage points. I thought you'd win by half a percentage points. And, and the difference between three percentage points and a half a percentage point is huge, and it's because, as Rich said, I think you guys changed the electorate in a way I didn't think was quite possible in the year 2012. James? Well, Politico found the same thing. We were doing a weekly poll for the final months of the campaign. We had a Democratic and Republican pollster. The, the Republican pollster just kept insisting there was no way Obama could win. There's no way, how do you win independence in Ohio and still yeah. lose the election? And the, we were in the field with a poll through the night before the election. And I was on a bus at 1.30 in the morning on Tuesday coming back from Romney's final rally in New Hampshire to Boston. And Ed Goh, as our pollster, could not have been more adamant that Romney was going to win the election based on the fact that our national poll and the battleground breakout showed that the race was tied and kind of downplaying some of the early vote achievements that you all had and then playing up the extremely likely to vote number. And it was just our poll was not picking up the fact that African Americans were going to be 15 percent of the electorate in Ohio. And, and as a result, we showed the, the race was tied. And obviously, don't feel it, bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, it wasn't, and it was, it was, it was that, that failure to capture that the electorate was just going to be fundamentally different. And talking to some of the folks in Boston the day after, that was what was most stunning. Is that it, that we're going to start, start tomorrow, tomorrow morning, Joe, on, uh, with Joe presenting the exit polling. Do you want to Well, speak one thing to I want to, no, I'll talk about exit polling tomorrow, but I, what I want to talk about is how early voting has changed the game completely. There were between 45 and 50 million votes cast before Dixville Notch cast its votes midnight on, on election morning. And our estimates, and you, you guys and I have better estimates, but our estimates on the early voting uh, surveys we did was the Obama Obama won by at least eight points nationally among early voters, maybe even more. So that means there was a three to four million vote lead the Obama campaign had in the bank before election day started. And indeed, on election day, when the final numbers get, get tabulated, Romney and Obama may have actually been tied of people who voted on election day. It's just those three or four million early vote margin in the bank for the Obama campaign held up. Okay. In, in every target state except for Ohio, we overperformed 2008, and they underperformed 2008. But what they did, it wasn't that they, they were going after very specific voters. It gets down to the granularity. And, right. Yeah, so. Right. Nancy. Just quickly, an anecdote because I, I, also a friend of Sasha's. I read the book when it came out. It confirmed what I saw on the ground. My anecdote is, Sunday and Monday, right before the election, I was in New Hampshire working in Concord and phone banks up there for Romney. But before I would go to the phone bank, I would drive through uh, territory I know in Concord, New Hampshire, and um, just see what was going on, just get a feel for the place. And in every single city block, there were at least four people, four teams with clipboards. In fact, at one point, I went down a street I know, and you had, uh, you had the battle of the clipboards going on. <laughs> you know, no, I, sh I got to that. No, I already got to that door. I got to that door. And it was just remarkable to see what was really happening. Then I was also at the Romney rally that night on Monday night, which was a very exciting event, no question about it. But there was no question that just seeing what was happening out on the ground was very different from what I was hearing calling favorables really to pull them out. 
uh, from the phone bank. There's just nothing that replaces people on, on the streets. Just nothing. Okay, Aaron. Uh, you know, I, I think it goes back a, a lot earlier talking about the campaign being in a lot of these states throughout 2011. And so uh, my colleague and I were hopscotching to different primary states, um, starting with obviously the Iowa caucuses. And every time we would go to a new state, the Obama campaign would say, hey, come check out our headquarters in Iowa, or come check out our headquarters in Ohio. Let's take you to a field office where we can introduce you to all the people that we have phone banking. And I went to one um, on the Sunday before Super Tuesday in suburban Columbus, and it was, it was probably 5 p.m. on a Sunday evening, and it was snowing, and there were 14 people in this field office making phone calls, and they showed me all the different things they were doing and the data they were inputting. Um, and I wrote a big story about it, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, my Scott Conroy, my colleague, went to another state and had the same experience. And it was over and over and over again. And obviously, the Obama campaign had a strategy of showing reporters that they were doing this. But when we would take the, this information to the Romney campaign and say, are you guys doing anything like this? Are you organizing yet? And they would say, you know, no, but this is just all for show. It's, you know, th this is not going to do much, at, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day. And, and, you know, for the reporters who actually went to, on the ground and looked into these field offices, it was clear that it was a big deal. And so that's why I think some of us weren't all that surprised that the ground game worked. Yeah. Well, you have okay. to pardon us if the Sunday before Super Tuesday we were really oh, super no, I understand. Yes. I don't. Okay, we're going to open up to <laughs> Q&A after Jeff, you... And then I'm going to ask Brent to make the final comment. Jeff. I'll just say, um, I agree with Jerry. I um, was a little s skeptical of, um, I guess I was hung up a little bit on enthusiasm as well. And I think part of that was um, I spent most of, of the time in the um, sort of after Labor Day out in battleground states uh, and sort of ping-ponging from headquarters to headquarters in Boston and Chicago. And there was no question that the enthusiasm was picking up tremendously on the Romney campaign. The rallies were huge, and I remember being in S Sydney, Ohio, the night before the vice presidential debate, I guess. So the first debate had already happened, and it was the largest size uh, Romney rally I'd ever seen. And I sent a tweet out something like, you know, these Romney crowds are huge. If Democrats want to know how huge, think Obama size or something. And it, it, like it, it was just a huge rally. But I think, so I'm like, wow, there is a lot of enthusiasm. And there was, but I think a part of it was that John McCain never got sort of that size of enthusiasm. So it was definitely exceeding 08, but it was, uh, um, um, I guess like that was the center of the activity. And you would go into the uh, Romney offices and, the, and there just like wasn't all that much stuff going on underneath the hood, I guess, as there was going on um, in the Obama offices. And throughout the campaign, I don't know how many times I interviewed Jeremy in Chicago, he would sort of uh, sit there as we asked our you know, inane questions. And it was just clear that you guys had more information and more data and were working off so many more things than my interviews at the Boston headquarters. It was just clear that you guys had a lot more going on. Now, um, at the time, it was sort of unclear I mean, if that was going to be enough because the headwinds were so uh, powerful. And even, even you guys, I think, in September and October, I mean, you were confident in your stuff, but you still um, seemed a little bit uncertain about the environment and the dynamic and things. So um, I was a little surprised that the ground game worked uh, as strong as it would. But in hindsight, um, like everything you told us all along the way, made sense, and you just had a lot of information. It was just an impressive amount of information. Brandon, did you have a final comment? Yeah, I just had one thing on, on uh, early vote that I think gets lost when we talk about early vote. Um, and these guys probably wouldn't even say it themselves, so I'll just say it. Um, it's not just about getting people to vote early. It's about the opportunity cost that goes into every voter. You have to take an action to get to the polls. So this clipboard thing is, is what made me think of it, is every person we got to vote early is someone we didn't have to send a person to their house or call on election day. So we took that off the table and that's another person in that limited amount of time of voting on, on election day that we could then expend that resource on. So it really was about not just getting votes banked for the sake of getting them banked and, and locking them in, which is important, but really opening up the amount, you know, basically spreading our opportunity cost out over a longer period so we could touch more people and actually do the things that you do in GOTV to get a person to go to the polls. And I think that just gets lost a little bit in the discussion. I think it's a really important and a very game-changing point when it comes to 
to early vote. And then the other thing I would say is, is uh, and I think Jeremy will, will, will uh, focus this, I think people will realize at some point, uh, and I think we probably learned this on the Dean campaign, is that crowd size is the worst indicator of what's gonna happen in a campaign. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, but you know what I mean? It's, just, it's, it's, it's a good visual, but you know, any decent camp, you know, you can get people to show up, but that's only that many people. I don't recall so, the Obama campaign making that argument four years ago. <laughs> okay. One quick, One quick comment quick. because you're a Jayhawk, Marlon. Thank you. The early voting thing I think is huge, and you know I think another point on that is that that was something that was used I think more as talking points instead of actual data, and we had you know 40 to 50 million data points where we saw our sporadic voters voting early, people that we were targeting who were you know low propensity voters but high support for the president, where we saw them voting, which just for us told us a good story about how election day could play out, that was getting lost in the message of what the public polls were saying, how everything was really, really tight. Right. We, so, we talked about, you know, public polls are based on likely voters, registered voters, and we were counting actual voters at that point, and that was, yeah. it didn't change our perception, but it gave us a higher level of confidence in what our numbers were talking right. okay. so about. I, I think it's huge moving forward. I have to move to Q&A from the audience. We've just had so much material to cover, so I'm sorry we're not having as much time. Please, a very brief question, no statements. <laughs> watching MSNBC at night, so thanks a lot for you guys being here. My I should question, hope so. <laughs> my question is prompted by Katie's comment about contraception issues for Governor Romney. So what role do you think the party platform plays in a campaign's message and therefore the voters' decision? And if your answer is no role at all, then when, tell me about the party platform and what role it plays. Some quick comments about the party platform, both sides, start on the Romney side. Um, I guess I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, you know, I think that uh, that what what Mitt had to sort of own and what he was tagged with was so much more than just what was passed at the platform meeting uh, in Tampa. Um, you know, it was it was words and ideas that had been kind of. Um, communicated by our primary opponents all through the primary. So by the time it got to the convention and, and the platform, you know, I'm not sure that that was really, you know, um, you know, particularly defining, um, you know, but certainly, uh, you know, it, you know, the platform is something that, that we paid close attention to and we're cognizant of, but I think, you know, and I, I think that our, our friends on the other side would sort of share this, that, you know, part of you just wants to get through that day at the convention and then just move on so that you can communicate the message you want to be talking about. And um, certainly, you know, while Mitt Romney's pro-life and, and pro-family, um, you know, we did not feel that our path to victory was to be spending a lot of time talking about social issues. We really felt that, that every minute that he wasn't talking about the economy and President Obama's failure on the economy was a lost opportunity. I can give a tactical answer from our perspective. Uh, I mean, you know, um, the party platform is, in, from an offensive perspective, is another opportunity to raise questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, really, when you're attacking your opponent, what you're doing is you're raising questions about them, and you're finding, trying to find new avenues in to get the folks here who write and, and the public to rewrite the thing you want them to write. So, uh, you know, that window in can be something their vice presidential nominee says, and you, at, you know get these guys to ask, do you agree with them? So it's another, it's a codified document that we can use and we would look through it and say, okay, here's this thing that we know most Americans don't agree with. Can we try to get someone to write a story about if Mitt Romney agrees with it or not? So it's really a tactical tool from our perspective. And then on the proactive side, I mean, look, we, we forget in this because these are so personality driven at the presidential level that these still are political parties. So there are functions of it, and it is very important to our delegates. I'm sure it is to, to yours as well. And it's a big part of what does happen at things like convention. People uh, really invest themselves in them. So I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Okay, next question. If you accept that our nation has a number of complex and difficult issues, does this professional, almost eternal type of campaign you discussed or help or improve quality resolution of those issues? Interesting question. Length of the campaign, does it help or impede? I mean, on the one, on the, on the one hand, um, you know, having a long time to have a conversation with our voters, which is what we were doing, about the president's vision and doing it at a very personal level, 
um, is, I think, a good thing for the country. I think giving our volunteers an opportunity to do one of the most patriotic things that you can do, which is to register another American to exercise one of the most beautiful rights that you have, to go out and vote, is a great thing. Um, and having time to do that and, and really build something that is community-based, um, engages people in the political process in ways that they weren't, um, you know, if you didn't have um, such a commitment to running a, a real campaign. Um, on the other hand, you know, we've got to govern as well, and that's something that I don't have experience doing. Um, I've been doing organizing. Um, but, I mean, I think, look, a county campaign, we were debating, we were actually debating some pretty big issues. I mean, we were, there was a whole conversation going on about taxes. Um, that's, a, that's a great debate to have. And we were actually having it in these battleground states and, you know, all across the country. Um, so I, I think there's more good than, than bad out of it. But you've got you to gotta recognize that there are some things that, you know, make it bad because, you know, people are always going to be looking at everything through a political lens. And sometimes it's better to not look at things through political ends and just look at what's best for the country. So, you know, I think there's good and bad. I think, it outweigh, I think the good outweighs the bad. It depends on how you, know, how you use it, I guess. At the end of the day, we're a country that still changes uh, leaders at the ballot box and not the point of the gun. So I think the more discussion we can have about that and how we pick them is a, is a good thing. Yeah. I think the, the media uh, response to that would be interesting because I think that, you know, whichever side you were on, you know, all of us in the two or three days after the election, we're just sort of, you know, uh, kind of paralyzed with exhaustion. But the, the press was on election night already speculating about, you know, the, the different candidates in 2016. And, you know, already we're all, you know, all in on 2016. And I'm thinking, you know, good Lord, can we, can we even get past the first of the year? <laughs> I mean, we're going to get jobs numbers tomorrow. <laughs> None of us sitting here. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> uh, these gentlemen care, and I care, the rest of you may not. But I'm about for to the first time in two years, I didn't know they were coming tomorrow. Exactly. Right. Hey, look, if they go up, it's just because the campaign's over. So I think that there is value in the permanent campaign. I think it's good when uh, sometimes decisions that are made to be politically prudent are good for the country. Uh, decisions that are shaped by popular opinion can be beneficial. Yeah, I think what's going to be interesting now is for the first time we'll see the permanent campaign become the permanent governing organization. You know, what you do with this, you have quite an operation in key states. And it's not just focusing on 2016, it's focusing on all the budget battles coming up this year and all the legislative battles going into the midterms and how this is directed and used. And I don't expect you even know at this point. but. I'm sure that's the great debate. It's, it's big, to me, it's bigger than we've all ever dealt with at party level, you know, in terms of party organization. You have a fueled operation of people with high expectations for their wishes being delivered. And what are you going to do with that if they aren't? And I think that'll be the interesting question of governing in the next year. Yeah, I, I would say just two quick things, not related to that. I think these guys can speak to anything on that much better than I can. But. Two is one is I think it's an interesting question to ask if it's good or bad, but I think it's also important to understand that these are not, you know, we didn't all wake up and decide to do this. There's a certain amount of mutually assured destruction uh, ness to this that's driven by new technologies, that's driven by, you know, the introduction of new tools that allow us to, you know, uh, engage in these processes over longer periods of time with lower costs, more money in the system. So it, I guess that's my way of saying it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's not like we could put the genie back in the bottle, and I'm sure people were having the same discussion about if television was good or bad, right? When TV came out, I think it's just kind of the march of history. But I will tell you what's so funny about it. You say all that, and you talk about the influence of Twitter, and this is just as a, as a private citizen. Uh, it's the oldest thing, and how it, it or the oldest political structure in the United States, and how it influences or interacts with that permanent campaign that I think is the most damaging, and that's the fact that because of the Electoral College, we are driven to a narrow path uh, of states that we engage in. I mean, it's just the idea that, um, you know, yes, we have this hyper-intense organization, and I think more than most campaigns, we have a national organization, but it's not, you know, North Carolina is not South Carolina. We have a lot of people engaged in, in islands across the country, uh, and I think that, that that's too bad sometimes. It's too okay. bad we don't have more national. I'm going to try to get through everybody that's queued up. Next question. Alice? My question has to do with the laws that were passed after the president was elected that were, um, depending on your perspective, I guess, uh, they, they were voter registration laws, let's call them that. Um, and they were, they seem to be designed to um, depress the vote of certain constituent groups. 
some of those laws have not even gone into effect yet fully, um, and others um, have. And I'm wondering what you, what both campaigns see as the future of free and fair elections given these laws. I'll go first. <laughs> so look, we should encourage people to vote. You may be the only one to go, by the way. We should, <laughs> we should encourage people to vote in this country. Every state should have as many early vote days as possible with, with, to some extent. You should be able to register on election day. In fact, you should be registered when you turn 18 um, by the government. You should, we should be fighting. Our secretaries of state, our state houses, our state senate should be fighting to make voting more accessible for more people. And we should celebrate that in this country. Instead, when the president was elected and when Republicans took uh, over some of these state houses, state senates, and governorships in 2010, they put in laws that were partisan. The uh, Republicans in Pennsylvania said these laws will help Mitt Romney win. Rick Scott knew in Florida that shortening early vote wasn't going wasn't to help the state budget. It wasn't for anything except, and you heard it from the Florida GOP chair, that they were designed to lower turnout for Democrats. And you hear that across the country. Millions of dollars were spent in Ohio of taxpayer money to go to the Supreme Court of the United States to stop people from voting the last three days of early vote. That's just wrong. It's totally wrong. We should be fighting to have more people vote, not less. It was partisan. It was meant to change the game. And we should be fighting against that. And every American should know about it and care about it. The only thing. Um, I agree. <laughs> Uh, I also think that everything is under the guise of voter fraud, which if you look across the country, um, there's really, it's, it's a ploy. Um, and I think it was all, to Bird's point, it's, it's a systematic thing that happens in many states that's all, um, uh, it's a ploy. So we, on the campaign side, we vigorously fought back um, against these laws uh, in many states. And in many cases, we were very successful. And I think regardless of if we're uh, running for office now or whoever runs in 16 or whatever, uh, that is something that we all got to continue to fight against because, uh, to Burr's point, we have to make this more open uh, and not shut more doors. And I think, given how open folks have been in Florida, Colorado, I forgot about that as well too, about uh, why these laws are getting designed. They talk about fraud, and they, you know, behind closed doors, they really talk about why they're doing it. Uh, we have to, we have to stay on that fight. Uh, and it's a little bit disappointing that we have to. Well, it, Joe, uh, I just want a little contrarian here. I, I think the Republicans oversold how much effect these laws could have. And I think the Democrats did a really good job of using these laws to motivate voters that felt like they were yeah, yeah. franchise to, to, to do it. So it, in, a, in a way, a lot of this talk by Republicans kind of backfired. Yeah. Um, in, I think mainly because you, you guys had the resources to overcome right. the limitations that were put in place, but I think there was a lot of motivation to people that felt like they were gonna be disenfranchised by these new laws to, to overcome that. What? My one issue with that would be, um, and this is just purely from a tactical standpoint, is our polling, focus groups, everything showed that the more we talked about it, the less people voted, that there is a chilling effect. So we actually went out of our way aggressively to not talk about these court cases, to do these things as quietly as possible. Now, there were some cases uh, when we had successes where we celebrated those publicly, but it was not our goal at any point during the campaign, uh, and not from any, and I'm not saying this from any type of, um, uh, um, you know, place of, uh, you know, pat ourselves on the back. This was a tactical decision based on data. It was not our goal to talk a lot about these. It was our goal to not talk about them, but solve the problem. And then once the problem was solved, make sure people knew what they could do to vote. Right. Right. Was but that across all platforms, running. though? Because the president gave so many interviews to black radio stations talking about yeah. this stuff. He didn't talk about it widely, like in the network news, but you guys, I, th I think, did a very successful job uh, making certain segments of the electorate very, very aware. I mean, you were running but targeted that, commercials, radio and TV, oh, yeah. to, uh, to educate them. I think there's a difference, between, yeah. there's a difference between educating um, yeah. and saying, look what they're trying to do to you. Yeah. Yeah, because but, that look what they're trying to do to you point, then they're like, well, what's with all these laws? What do I got to do? Maybe I just won't go do it. But it's like, hey, you should go to the polls and here's what you need to bring given whatever the law it is when we weren't fighting yeah. against it. And even the 2000 ad, that wasn't targeted. That was a pretty widely distributed ad. And that was more of a, uh, you know, if you look at that ad, it was about every vote matters. It wasn't targeted at a, it wasn't a fraud ad, I guess. But. Right. Okay, let's go to the next question. Are super PACs a threat to democracy and should they be banned? 
<laughs> look, look, again, I, I made the Fred Wertheimer comment earlier today. It's, it's you know, all, all, of the, all of this campaign finance reform tries to get money out of politics, yet we spend more on yogurt advertising a year than we do spend on, on politics. The point is, is if, if you would let candidates and party committees raise unlimited funds and report them immediately, have a 12-hour reporting, you keep, you, you, it's, it's a sunshine effect. With super PACs and 501c4s, people can, can, make, uh, uh, can make anonymous contributions to a lot of these. Why not have an open and, and honest discussion? Uh, the, a candidate takes a million dollar check from somebody, they're the ones that have to be held accountable for that. But it should be open and, and immediately disclosed it's, it's a First Amendment right. You're never going to be able to tell somebody you can't raise more money to, to get your message out. It's just, it, it, it's a basic constitutional right that is never going to be abridged. So we just keep spreading it out to super PACs and to other, and take, take the message away from the parties and take the message away from the candidates. I think you also when, take away a lot of the accountability that you yeah. have with the party committees and the campaign committees. I, I think at the probably. national level and the state level, it balances out as long as both sides are roughly, I mean, both sides can come up with hundreds of millions of dollars, they're going to roughly bounce out. I think it's where it really is insidious is at the local level where one side comes in. I, it's a, it, people talked about Sheldon Adelson and Foster Freeze and those might. Mike Bloomberg, mayor of New York, had a pact that spent $3 million in a congressional election in California to defeat a um, pro-gun control Democrat. Um, why, why is Mike Bloomberg spending three million dollars on a race between two Democrats in California? Um, you, know, you, you can agree with his position on gun control or against his position on gun control, but that, that does seem a little weird that the, governor, the mayor of New York is spending three million dollars on a, a, a congressional race in California. Okay, we get uh, at least one more question. We'll try to do a couple more. It appeared that both camps decided not to talk about the conduct and a successful conclusion of the wars that are ongoing, I hasten to add. Why was that? From the Romney perspective, as I said before, we, we really felt that um, any time that Mitt Romney wasn't talking about Barack Obama's failure on the economy uh, was a missed opportunity. And every time he wasn't talking about how he would do things differently, um, it was a lost opportunity. So that's why we didn't. But before I move on, I just. I don't want to leave on the table this notion that somehow the Democrats care about people voting and the Republicans don't. Mitt Romney and the Republican Party care very much about giving people an opportunity to vote. And the suggestion that the Obama campaign's efforts to expand early voting had nothing to do with political strategy and it was all just an altruistic pursuit of freedom and democracy, <laughs> I think is maybe overstating it no, no, a tad. We do better when more people vote. So, sure. So, and, so, and, so, so, and so in addition to your, which I, th I, I do believe is your pursuit of liberty and democracy, um, uh, there, there was also a very clear tactical advantage. And, um, you know, at the same time, you know, I don't think that the Obama campaign and the Democrats um, don't believe that there's any kind of fraud that goes on. And so, um, you know, while our efforts at making sure that there is no fraud um, do have a tactical benefit, they also are part of the pursuit of freedom and democracy. So, you know, I think both parties care about those things. Both parties uh, want to ensure the, the sort of the sacred system um, and, and have really different beliefs of how you go about doing that. But I don't think either one, um, and regardless of what you know, maybe some folks in our party, in particular states, may have articulated, uh, you know, not, neither side is without political motive, and neither side is without um, sincerity either. So, um, so on the war question, <laughs> um, I, I would uh, I would actually uh, um, question the premise of the question. I think we actually did talk about uh, the war a fair amount. Um, it was one of the president's uh, proof points of, in terms of the things he's accomplished during this campaign, it was part of all of his speeches. Um, I do think because of the nature of the environment we were in, both sides would agree that it was the economy that drove the conversation. So uh, it wasn't the type of thing that we were going to go out and necessarily uh, you know, run uh, standalone ads on, but that was a, a tactical decision. Uh, but it was a very important uh, motivator for us for a couple reasons. One. We worked very hard, and we've worked very hard as a party to make inroads with military, uh, military members and veterans, and I think you've seen that in our vote chair numbers, uh, fundraising numbers from DOD, um, uh, from DOD uh, employees and whatnot. Uh, we, were, we had a very active constituency program uh, based around veterans that we were very proud of. Uh, and two, it was a huge motivator for young voters. Uh, you know, it was a, to them it's a social issue, ending the wars. People who are 18 and voting for the first time or eight years old when uh, we went into Iraq, 
uh, it was a big issue for them. Uh, you know, they are more likely to know someone who served. They're more likely to have had their families touched. Um, uh, so we did talk about it a fair amount. I don't think it was as central uh, because of the economy, but it was definitely something we were proud of and talked a lot about. Okay, we have time for one last question, and I'm sorry we're going to have to conclude. Uh, I wanted to return really quickly to the voter suppression laws, the <laughs> restrictions on early voting, the photo ID, the restrictions on registration drives. Actually, uh, Chap Rackaway and I and another colleague of ours have, have done some research on this and looked at different turnout patterns in different battleground states that didn't did not have the laws. And what we found is that the Democrats very effectively counteracted the impact of those laws with their very aggressive GOTV campaign. But there was still some residual effect on the Republicans. Uh, guys, you repressed your own voters, okay? Um, and if that holds up, if that holds up, my question is, do you think Republicans are still going to champion and advocate for these laws? I was at a restaurant yesterday, two days ago with my family, and the, the, uh, the server had a, had a badge on that says, we ID under 99 and a half. So you have to have a, have to have a beard, uh, you have to have an ID to get a beard, you have to have an ID to cash a check at a bank, you have to have an ID. So I, I don't understand, over 70% of Americans support a, a voter ID, some sensible voter ID. Now that, that, that's not, there's nobody, to Katie's point, nobody's in, in favor of suppressing the vote. We're not, we're not for that at all. But Marlon, to your, to your point, in 2000 in New Mexico, there is voter fraud, I've seen it. I've, 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 I've dealt with it firsthand on voting machines in, in a variety of ways. So this whole notion that somehow voter ID, that showing an ID when we have to show an ID to get on an airplane, to, to buy a beer, to, to do any number of things in our society, and yet we don't have to do it for our most basic fundamental right where we are deciding the leaders of the largest free nation in the world, I, I, I just think that that's, I, I think that that's a, a, an illegitimate I, But I'd like to see your evidence. I think there's some evidence in the exit poll that you're right. And, and I think mainly it's because the Democrats have the resources to, to overcome it. But, what you see a lot in the data is college-educated, wealthy voters are going to vote no matter what. Minority voters, younger voters, Hispanic voters need a push. And the, the Democrats obviously had the money to, to, to target that. I think what you saw is less educated white voters that would be predisposed to vote Republican this year needed more of a push and didn't get it. And one of the things that may or may not have suppressed it was voter ID, but you may be, you may be onto something. Well, if voter ID laws are the reason we lost the election, then we need to totally rethink everything that we're looking at. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we can work with you. <laughs> I, would, I would say just three things uh, really quick. Uh, most of them are, are again, I, I tend to think of things more tactically, but one is that, yes, we had the resources to overcome some of the challenges that these laws created, but that's not how we wanted to spend our resources. The money and time we spent in Florida alone on voter education was money and time we could have spent somewhere else uh, in terms of voter, uh, actually, turnout efforts and, and, you know, not going to someone we already knew wanted to vote for us to make sure they knew how to vote. That's kind of a waste of time if we don't have to do it. So that's one. Two, I do think that, uh, and this goes back to uh, something that uh, Rich and Katie were saying is, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the candidate owns everything that is said by people of their party, and that is unfortunate. But the other unfortunate truth is that there are people in the Republican Party, and I don't think it's representative of the entire Republican Party, who openly do talk about voter ID laws that way. And I think, uh, you know, if I could boil down what I think uh, uh, Bird was getting at, it's that we just, that shouldn't be acceptable from anybody. That's right. um, and the, the third thing, and, that, and Bird said this is too, is the goal should always be to get as many people to vote as possible, just because, and that's not a tactical thing. Sometimes doing the right thing has a tactical advantage, but that's just, you know, to tactically to say, even if it's a, you know, I agree 100%, but to even tactically say these voter ID laws will hurt Democrats and do it in a tactical way, that is still suppressing the vote. And that, that to me is just still wrong. And sure, maybe we're like fighting in certain states to get more, more early voting instead of other states, but we're not actively suppressing, trying to suppress well, I don't think we would. I don't think we would argue that somebody saying that is, is not a good thing and a right thing, and it's definitely not a smart thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this was clearly not sort of part of the overall Romney for president First, strategy. Actually, when I, in the spirit of Bob Dole, I think that <laughs> what we should do, because <laughs> I wasn't talking about voter ID at all, in fact. And I think if we want to have a real honest debate with, in, it's going to happen in states, that's where all this stuff is decided, is to, if people would get together and Democrats, Republicans say, you know, our overall effort is to get more people to turn out because in the United States we have, we should have more people turning out. Um, and we just should. And how can we do that? And how can we also make sure we have integrity in the, in the system? Uh, I think you could get a lot of people together to say 
you know, let's come up with some laws that make it more accessible. And at the same time, you know, there are states that have photo ID, but they also have multiple days of voting. They have ways for people to get free IDs, which otherwise is a poll tax. Um, and, and all those other kind of things, we could actually get reach a lot of common ground on this. Instead, it becomes a, a, a just a debate over, yes, for, you know, some people saying voter fraud exists, and other people saying this is you know, voter suppression. There's a way to do this and get to places like Oregon and Colorado where voter turnout is actually going up significantly That's because right. access to voting is easier. That's right. But I'm not sure that, um, I mean, I, I don't quibble with the notion that more people voting is a good thing, but I'm not sure, frankly, that people voting in the middle of September is a good thing. I mean, I think that the notion that a campaign actually has to play out and that, that uh, voters should have the full benefit of all of the information. I mean, you've got people voting before any of those debates took place. And, you know, so sure that's an advantage to an incumbent president that everybody knows and everybody's familiar with and his record is out there to, to be decided on. But, you know, when you've got a challenger that hasn't yet had the opportunity to even be introduced to the American people, is it fair and is it right, you know, for, for people to be driven to the polls when they don't yet really have all the information. I mean, when you look at, at so many of our elections and information that's come out in the last 10, 14 days that might have actually changed somebody's vote um, had, had they waited. You know, I, you know, and I just throw that out there as a point of debate that the notion of lots of people voting, fine, but, but really, you know, expanding it to the degree we have, is that, you know, the best the, way? I'm not sure. The problem that you have is you have Republican governors, Secretary of States, spending millions of dollars to stop people from voting the last three days when they could have voted the 30 days before. You have Wisconsin laws that make you have to register in each 1,800 municipalities to be able to register a voter. Mm -hmm. these, laws are, these laws are insane. And they're so extreme. And you guys have to figure out a way to stop those kind of things. And then you can have a real debate about mm -hmm. what kind of ID would be acceptable, all those kinds of things. But you have such extreme laws that are so blatant and so designed to make it hard for people to register to vote. Yeah. You know, to cut the number of the hours in Florida, to not allow you to vote on the weekend, but do, do it on the weekday, to have uh, vote by mail last longer than vote in person when you know vote by mail, you know, is favors Republicans. Like, those are the kind of things that, you, that, that, that well, are out there. And it's I'm not, not necessarily your campaign. I'm not going to sit here and defend every, every voter law that yeah. every Republican legislature has pushed through, but I will just reiterate that the notion that the Obama campaign only cares about the integrity of the mm -hmm. system I think is a little bit on, unfair. On a practical <laughs> point, I do think the one thing that it did do in some of these states was make our machine better. And in a state like Florida that has these significant voter registration laws where checkout forms turn in within two days, uh, and there's just so many other rules around it. And this was also the benefit of starting early. We learned in 2011, like, here's the system we need to have in place to be able to run a significant voter registration program and tested it very small. So by the time we had volumes and you know tens of thousands of voter registration forms coming in every week, it was just like clockwork. So yeah. it, it, it did make our, our team. I better. would say there were a couple of days after the first debate when it was not good to be the incumbent president. <laughs> but, okay. On that note, on that note, um, we will begin tomorrow promptly at 8:30 with Joe Linsky talking to us about the exit polls. We'll cover kind of the fallout of the election. I think everybody knows how the movie ended. If you, didn't, if you didn't catch the ending of this movie, you can consult with me afterwards. But we'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank our panelists again.